Oh, Frank Kellogg, as I live and breathe. Tell me, what is the mighty Secretary of State of the United States of America doing here in this humble office of a lowly senator from the state of Montana? Now, nah, Senator Walsh, if I didn't know you better for my term in the U.S. Senate, when you and I had those skirmishes across the aisle, I would be charmed by what you said. <laughs> well, what can I do for you, my friend? Well, I need to know as much as I can about this whole Teapot Dome scandal. Well, I'd be happy to help you out, Frank, but wouldn't you better be better off talking to uh, Owen Roberts, the special counsel? I mean, after all, he was appointed by President Coolidge to investigate and to prosecute this mess. I need to get it from you. Everybody knows there's nobody in the country that knows more about Teapot Dome than you. In fact, I doubt if there had been a special prosecutor if you hadn't done what you did. Well, Teapot Dome certainly did consume a oh, better part of a decade of my life. You know it's going to be your legacy. I'd much rather be remembered for the work I did in helping to write the 19th Amendment and also for helping to uh, abolish child uh, labor. Now, Tom, don't dismiss the value of what you've done. Nobody, nobody could have imagined the level of corruption that existed in the president and the uh, with the president and the executive branch. It is, I know, a tough realization, but in the long term, the people are going to be smarter for it and the country's going to be better off. We can only hope. <laughs> Have some Minnesota 13. Hey, this is good stuff, you know. It comes from Stearns County. Mmm. <laughs> ah. Now, this whole thing is uh, uh, so bad, and is that it seems like uh, you know every time we turn around, there seems to be another aspect of this whole thing that surfaces, and it's uh, it's embarrassing. You know, it seems like, especially internationally, President uh, Coolidge and I get questions about it all the time. I need to be prepared, okay. And so I need to know all you know. And tell me, what about this Continental Trading Company? Oh, Continental Trading, that was just a dummy corporation put together by the oil executives. They skimmed money from their own money, from their own companies, and they used it for government bribes on behalf of the oil industry. Well, I need to know everything about it. And Teapot don't. Fundamentally, Tom, I need to know everything that you know. Well, that's a very tall order, Frank. <laughs> Keep in mind. You know, I was investigating this for the better part of 10 years with Teapot Dome and the other oil reserves and leasings that went on. I don't know that you have either the time or the patience to hear it all. I do, and I know what I'm asking, Tom. So, where did this whole mess begin? Oh, that is a very interesting question. You know, the actual illegal activity in the leasing of those oil fields to the oil companies by the government officials that didn't start until November of 1921. But I believe that really the, what made it all possible was, took place in a smoke-filled room back in June of 1920. That was at the Republican National Convention where the committee was engineering the presidential candidacy of Warren G. Harding. We'll never know everything that happened in that room but that it had a major impact, there can be no doubt. We've been over that already. He will never support it. He has to. The fact remains we've had four ineffective nomination ballots at that convention today. Yesterday. What? Uh, it's after midnight. Oh, we're going to have the Democrats another four years. No, we most certainly are not. Well, the delegates are entrenched, the party is divided. What do you propose we do, Henry? Huh. I propose that we act like the leaders of the Republican Party. And do what? Uh, the conservatives will not s support Wood. The progressives will definitely not support Loudon <laughs> and Johnson. He's threatening to bolt the Republican Party unless we formally oppose joining the League of Nations. And I'm with him on that. <sighs> And then there's another 15 candidates on top of them. Look, look, there's common ground to be had here. 
The people are wary after the war, and President Wilson's domestic policies have been bad for business. Don't you mean his wife's policies? <laughs> She's the one who's actually running the country. Which only furthers my point. All the delegates can agree that we need to get back to how things were, back to normalcy. The fact of the matter is, none of our candidates are first rate. Mm -hmm. We need to decide, you, me, all of us, which of these candidates can all of the delegates be compelled to support? How do we get them there? And we need to do all this before balloting begins again tomorrow. This morning? Oh, wow. wow. How about Hughes? Oh, no, he had his chance against Wilson back in 16. You know, I think that Knox might be a good compromise candidate. He's somebody that could unite the progressives and the conservatives. No, he's too old. They call him Sleepy Phil. Ah, uh, well, that may be true, but I'll tell you, there's 38 electoral votes in the state of Pennsylvania. Ah. We can use those at the election time. That's true. Pennsylvania voters cannot be counted on to swing Republicans simply to put one of their own in the White House. And Knox voted against women's suffrage. Could be a real problem now that women can vote. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about that. <laughs> Notwithstanding a few loudmouth women in the National Women's Party, women uh, understand that politics is a purview of men. That's right. If they vote at all, they'll vote as their husbands do. Yeah, well, I've heard that Knox's health is failing. Yeah, I've heard the same thing. Wouldn't be surprised if he's dead within a year. Yeah. What do you think of Warren G. Harding? Yeah, Harding. Huh? Well, you'd, Harding. you'd propose him because you're his campaign manager. <laughs> easy now, easy now. Harry is one of our best political operatives. He helped put Taft and McKinley in the White House. That's Say true. your piece, Harry. All right, okay. Look, at Harding is, uh, his stance on politics is generally liberal. All right? Mm -hmm. And his temperament is such that he's going to bring in the conservatives and he's going to bring in the liberals. Mm -hmm. but, yes. ha but Harding hasn't even consolidated his own state delegation. Mm -hmm. Half mm -hmm. of them are supporting mm -hmm. Wood. Right. What? Mm -hmm. But they're going to support him as soon as they realize that Wood can't win. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wood can't win. Wood has the support of Wall Street, right. Rockefeller, Marshall Field, Andrew, Andrew Mellon, and he had 30% of the votes on the last ballot at the convention. Yeah. Which is exactly the same number he had on the first three ballots. Yeah, and that's the problem. Harry's right. Wood is too independent to get the support of the entire party. All he's doing is tying up a third of the delegates. We need to push him out. Harding is just too obscure. Yeah. What has he done in his six years in the Senate from Ohio? Mm. He's picked the interest of the oil companies. Ah. Why should we care about the oil companies? Do you know how many cars were sold last year? Two million automobiles. The demand outpraces the supply. Listen, gas stations are growing up faster than speakeasies. The oil company is making money. They're printing money. Look at the future of our economy is oil. Well, why are they so keen on Harding? He's a man's man. More than that, he's sympathetic to the drilling needs of the oil companies. Listen, listen. After eight years of Wilson, they would be ecstatic to have a buddy in the White House. So what is oil prepared to do for us? Southwest. Right. Southwest and Pennsylvania. They'll give you that too, as soon as they understand Harding can win. And I don't mean he can just win the nomination. I mean he can win the presidency. Gentlemen, what do you think? Yeah, any part in a storm. <laughs> Somebody go wake him up and get him up here. Okay. All right. Harry, not you. We need to still ask you some questions. Reed, go find him. All right, now, Harry, you've been advocating for this Harding for a long time. What is it you see in him? Same thing you just said. This is the first, this is the first election 
that they've got women, all right? Number one, women are going to be voted. All right. He's a good-looking guy. He's affable. Yeah, that's true. Hell, he is yeah, the best-looking presidential material since George Washington. Yeah. Bottom line on this is this. His wife, you understand? Mm. His wife was the manager of the Marion Star newspaper. Right. Okay? Think of what she's going to be telling all of those women's groups when she's out there campaigning. <laughs> and more than that, she can handle herself in front of reporters. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Harry. But tell us the bad now. <laughs> Why, well, he's got a mistress. Oh. <laughs> well, he brought her out to D.C. with him. He's probably with her right now. Fathered a kid with her, I heard. Oh. Terrific. Oh, it just means he's a normal red-blooded American male. The girl is not going to be a problem. No. You know, this, that's what you say. But what about the others? There's got to be others. Oh, yeah. This sounds like it could get expensive. How are the coffers, Will? Well, we can't afford, afford a very large exposure without help. So I guess this is when we'll find out how loyal those oil guys will be to us. Uh, uh, what? what uh, that was oh. quick. That was quick. Oh, I found him wandering in the halls. Senator Harding, Senator Harding, do you know why we called you here? Well, I don't see any girls, so I'm hoping it's poker. <laughs> we are trying to determine if you are fit to be president. Of what? Oh, geez. America, Senator Hardin, the United States of America. We're asking you to tell us on your conscience whether there's anything that would disqualify you from being president. Gentlemen, <laughs> I see no reason in the sight of God why I shouldn't be president of the United States. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Looks like we got work to do. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. 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 How does it feel to know that in less than a year you could be first lady? The election is a long way away, and Warren is absolutely lacking in ambition or intelligence. Is that doubt I hear? That's not the Florence I know. No, we'll win. We have to win. The election of a Republican president is the most important thing in the world today. We need to get every single vote we can. There she is. But it will be through my sheer will, not his, How that we get to the White House. No doubt. A delegate asked Harry, his campaign manager, who his second choice would have been for the Republican nomination. Do you know who he said? Oh, do tell. Me. Oh, delightful. If only that could be. Oh, it will happen. Now that women have the vote, it won't be long before we have a woman president. <laughs> and the nation will have a first gentleman. With a man hosting, the White House parties won't be such elegant affairs. No, but the time for discussion is over. Women are in politics, and it's their duty to make their participation effective. From the White House, I can help them understand their government and ensure they'll have audiences with the chief executive. Ugh, Warren is so infuriating. He only wants to have a good time and give other people a good time. He was like this when he was running the Marion Star and we met. The best thing that ever happened to him was that he got sick. That was the start of his success because then I came in, took over the paper and turned it around. <laughs> After that, I've had to prop him up through two terms as state senator and then as lieutenant governor and then as US senator. Now I have to do it all again. You love it, and you know it, and you're good at it. Well, he's not making it any easier. She's come back into the picture. Which one? Oh, I'm sorry. No, that was a fair question. There have been many. Carrie Phillips. <laughs> 
No, not her. He promised you that was over years ago. How did you find out? He told me, but only because he wanted my advice. He's kept her on as a mistress, and she just learned that, oh, surprise, he has other mistresses. So now he's running for president. She's blackmailing him. So now he wants my help. How much does she want? A lot more than we can afford, because money's not what she's after. She gave him an alternative. Divorce me, give up politics, and marry her. Well, what did you tell him? I told him he's going to have to come clean to the Republican National Committee and, and get their help. I'll help Warren with most things, but not this. Never this. Oh, I know I should have divorced him a decade ago, but now I've worked too damn hard to throw away everything I've accomplished for him. And I'll be damned if I let that German sympathizer, Carrie Phillips, push us out. Oh. Every woman in D.C. is after Warren. Well, can you blame us? <laughs> His affairs are nothing new. What's really bothering you? Oh, you know me better than anyone, Evelyn. We're both Leos. We understand each other. Oh, he's always had pretty girls on the side. I think I knew that even before I knew that. Oh, but he said something when we talked about the blackmail that put a dagger in my heart. He said I was the best pal a man could have. He meant it. He actually thought he was being kind. I don't know whether I'm hurt or angry or relieved. Maybe I'm all three. Oh, I need to sort this out. Talk to a psychologist or something. Oh, don't do that. I've tried them. They're all nuttier than I am. <laughs> if you need guidance, I have an astrologer you should see. <laughs> Why, she provides readings for all of Washington's elite. She predicted President Garfield's assassination. She advised Edith Wilson back when she was Edith Galt that someday she would be in the White House. Why, Edith thought that was preposterous. This was before she even met President Wilson and a full six months before his wife died. But marry into the White House she did. I hear that Edith Wilson brings her to the White House for weekly readings. I've never heard that. Oh, she keeps it a secret. She sneaks her in, which I think is so disrespectful. What's her name? Madame Marcia. My friend Evelyn McLean referred me to you. Oh, I foresaw this. Really? No. <laughs> Do have some tea. Oh, thank you. Uh, whom am I addressing? Oh, I prefer to remain anonymous. Well, at least give me your birth date. August 15th, 1860. Oh. Oh, I see in your birth chart that Jupiter is very dominant with you. Henceforth, I shall call you Jupiter. Give me your palm. Oh, this isn't for me. I seek a reading on behalf of someone else. This other person, did you bring a possession? No. Then give me the birth date. November 2nd, 1865. Ooh, Scorpio. Uh, drink your tea while I consult the position of the stars on this date, and uh, while I turn my thoughts within. Please be silent, that I may be oblivious to all externals. I throw my mind into an infinity where there is neither time nor space. Uh, uh, my vision is 
foggy, uh, obscure. Ah, ah, pictures begin to form before my inner eye. I begin to see things as they really are. Uh, this person for whom you seek a reading, this is a man. Oh, no woman could be strong enough. Oh, don't say that, Madame Marcia. A woman might be found who is strong enough. Uh, but you're right, this is a man. Mm -hmm. Oh, I detect earthly love and, oh, gambling for royal stakes with terrifying and dangerous influences. His fate will depend on the actions of his friends or on uh, uh, the influence exerted by marriage or love. Oh, he is impulsive and given to making promises and extending complete confidence to all his friends. Oh, his money will be made through the employment of many people or perhaps in public service. He is prominent in public life. Oh, I see many love affairs of a clandestine nature. <laughs> if this person should choose to run for president, there is no power on earth that may defeat him. He is in the running. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh. <laughs> Following the splendid climax in the house of preferment, I see the sun and Mars in conjunction in the eighth house of the zodiac. This is the house of death. I foresee a sudden violent or peculiar death that, oh, I should stop. I wish to know it, all of it. I'm not afraid. The stars say that this person will be the next president of the United States, but he will not live out his term. The end, when it comes, will be sudden, uh, after an illness of short duration. Poison or its effects are indicated. It is written in the stars. And the stars, dear Jupiter, never lie. My husband does not believe in astrology, but I do. I must guide him. Tell me how to guide him. This you should do. Hand me your cup, please. Ah. I see in the tea leaves that yours is the map of a strong person. Oh, a dominant, willful, tenacious person with tremendous powers of concentration. Uh, you have the desire to lead. <laughs> you must be strong. Take a firm stand and hold to it. Thank you so much, Madam Marcia. Oh, wait! The influence of Saturn indicates melancholy or perhaps unhappiness in domestic affairs. And with your Mars in Capricorn, death will come to you suddenly, perhaps as the result of an illness of long standing. Oh, it will follow your widowhood. I am sorry. I wanted to know it all. You will die in honor. When he is elected, I promise you, you will be named the official White House astrologer. <laughs> and I will not be bringing you in through the back door. You are very welcome. And now, uh, about my fee. Uh, hello, Mrs. Phillips. Uh, I'm Will Hayes, chairman of the Republican National Committee. Where's Warren? As you can imagine, Senator Harding is very busy campaigning, so he, he sent me uh, 
he, he really wishes he could be here. I bet. <laughs> oh, well, he, he really wishes he, he could be here. Uh, he sent me here, however, to um, sort out this um, misunderstanding. <laughs> There's no misunderstanding. He had an affair with me for 15 years. He told me he would leave his wife. He didn't. Now he's going to pay. Or I will make sure he never runs for president or runs for office ever again. You know, he is so heartbroken and uh, confused by this uh, turn in your friendship. Uh, he will do anything he realistically can to make you happy again. <laughs> I see that. <clears throat> Must have really put him out to send his lackey on his behalf. <clears throat> he wants you to understand that, uh, <laughs> that he was always well-intentioned that he takes full blame for any unintentional blunders along the way, and he is hoping that the two of you can go on with your lives and your friendship, which he cherishes so much. <laughs> oh, my God, Warren has no respect for you at all, does he? What? He obviously told you nothing about me. You are making a fool of yourself. Just stop messing around and tell me how much you're going to pay. Well, be assured that Senator Harding absolutely wants to give you something, but it is important that you understand that he's not doing this for his sake, but because he cares for you. He sent you into the lioness's den armed with that? Well, I really my, don't think that. My goodness, he's off with his friends <clears throat> drinking, and you're here? I, I, it's important that you understand that... Just that, tell me how much. Well, that our resources are quite limited. <laughs> so, yeah. You know he wrote love letters to me, right? Intimate ones? Hundreds of them? Well, uh, you know, if there is any negative publicity out of this whatsoever, we are, we are convinced it would be quite minimal. <laughs> However, nonetheless, we would be uh, prepared to uh, prepare, provide for your well-being with uh, $5,000 a year for as long as he is in public office. Harry, darling, sweetheart, adorable. I'm yours now, anytime, for all time. Well, you know, Senator Harding is a very affectionate person. He writes very nice letters to me as well. <laughs> I want to smother you with kisses. Thousands of them. Wistful. Wild. Wet. Wavering. Well, you know, that just goes to show how much he cared for you. Who cares? Cares, yes. Still cares for you, which, which is why we would be willing to uh, double that gift to $10,000 a year. Now, we can just take care of that right now, and I will be I on my way. I want to feast my eyes to intoxicate them with your glorious breasts and matchless curves and exquisite shapeliness. I want to fund Oh, $2,000 a month, a month, every month for as long as he is in office. <laughs> Did you know he was a poet? Oh, of course he's a poet, yes, I did. I love your back. I love your breasts. Darling, to feel where my face rests. I love your poise of perfect thighs when they hold me in paradise. Okay, 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 okay. What, uh, why don't you just tell me what it is you want? 2000 a month is fine, but I want $25,000 up front. <laughs> Deal, but I will take these letters with me. I didn't. No. Okay, uh, but um, but you are to remain confined to your home until election day. Hell no. <clears throat> How about uh, <laughs> you don't leave the state of Ohio? No. <sighs> oh, how about how about, how about how about you uh, you leave the country till after election day? You're paying. <laughs> okay. A tour of Asia, I think. Fine. And I like to travel in style. Naturally. <laughs> Mr. Hayes, tell Warren I wish him the best of luck on the election. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is nice. You know, I was worried we wouldn't have time for our weekly poker games once I became president. Well, you made it pretty easy, Mr. President, by 
making all your friends your cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I knew there was a reason I did that. Except that Charlie isn't going to be doing very well. Look at that pile of chips he's got. It's going down. Well, you know, Veterans Bureau just doesn't pay as well as justice. <laughs> Give me a break. You guys are you guys are busting at the seams. Don't you have don't you have control of like half a billion dollars in government spending? You know, I control everything except my salary. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, none for me. Uh, one card, Mr. President. You know, with the thousands of disabled and wounded veterans, you're going to need to build a lot of hospitals, aren't you? Yeah, you got a point there. You're going to be letting a, a lot of I'll building contracts. I bet there's a lot of competition for those contracts. Yes. Yeah. You're a bet, Harry. I bet five. I'll tell you, I don't, I don't envy you. Not a bit. I, I can't imagine how you're going to select from among all of those qualified bidders. Well, I certainly would appreciate any advice you could give. I'm out. <laughs> Fold. You know, probably not as difficult as you might think. Uh, those construction guys especially are quite knowledgeable about what it takes to win a contract. <laughs> I'll see you five and raise your ten. Oh. Uh, I think you'll find it very satisfying to work with uh, construction guys. Five to stay in there, Harry. I bet ten. Just remember <laughs> one thing. Make sure you give them enough in the way of resources to completely finish. The job. Right, let's see All what right. you got. I got Jack High Straight. <laughs> Full house. Oh, oh man. Oh. I think your uh, oh. luck's starting to turn there, yes, Charles. Oh. All right. You know, you're all my good friends. We've come a long way since our days in Ohio. To the Ohio gang. Yeah. Yes. Uh, guys. I'm from Hawaii. Oh. Yeah. To the Ohio and Hawaii gang. To, yes, all right. Speaking of Hawaii, Edwin's over there right now. Yeah, I know. Uh, something about the Pacific Fleet. Um, doesn't he know the Great War is over? Uh, say, Harry, can I have my Secretary of the Navy flogged for missing out on poker night? <laughs> I'll, I'll make a note, Mr. President. <laughs> He's, uh, he's concerned about the Japanese. Thinks they're our most probable enemy. Says he wants to build up fuel oil reserves in Hawaii. Good, good. Anyway, the Navy has a few petroleum reserves, like this one in Wyoming, um, Teapot Dome. That's a strange name. There's a, there's a big rock there that looks just like a teapot. Oh, sure, I see. Anyway, there's, there's an issue of drainage. Uh, Albert. Is this going to take a long time? No, Mr. President. You see, there are hundreds of private oil wells adjacent to our petroleum reserves that are probably all tapping into the same source of oil below ground. OK, it'd be like if I took my own straw and drank from your milkshake. Well, I wouldn't like that. Not one bit. <laughs> no, no, Mr. President. So you can see the problem. Harry, Albert, do I look? Like, I want to talk about problems. Of course. I'm sorry, Mr. President. This can wait until tomorrow. I don't think you understand. I don't want to talk about it at all. That's why I made you the Secretary of the Interior. I want you to work on it and then go fix it. I know how to fix it, and I'd be handling it right now. And I can do good by our friends in the oil industry in the process, except the petroleum reserves are in the control of the Secretary of the Navy. Then go have Edwin take care of it. Yes, Mr. President. Except the Bureau of Mines has the expertise here, and they are in my department. Albert, if you could just sign an executive order transferring control of the petroleum reserves to my department, I'll take care of everything. So let me get this straight. If I sign this order, there'll be no more talk of 
drainage, or teapots, or milkshakes? Never. Done. Thank you, Mr. President. I won't let you down. Albert, you have my complete confidence. Hell, if a man of your fine character can't be trusted, then, well, I'm not fit to be president of this United States. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So when Harding became president, he surrounded himself with his pals and political cronies, including Albert Fall, who he appointed to be Secretary of the Interior. Have a cigar. Oh, thanks. <coughs> Fall proceeded to <coughs> wrestle the control of the Western Oil Reserves away from the Navy Department and into his own Department of the Interior. Those reserves were created by President Taft to provide an emergency supply of oil for our Navy in the event of a national emergency. I became involved when the report came out that Secretary Fall had secretly leased the Teapot Dome oil field to oil executive Harry Sinclair and his Mammoth Oil Company. Mammoth Oil? That's not a very subtle name if your intent is to rip off the people of the United States. That's right. That wasn't lost on me. Several senators came to me and they suggested that we should look into it. So we asked Secretary Fall for an explanation. And then he sent to us boxes and boxes of, oh, geological survey data and all sorts of other incomprehensible information. When my Senate colleagues saw that, they hit the trail. But on the way out the door, they said, Tom, you'd be the perfect man for this. Ah, so one of the things they did on this is that uh, they didn't realize how dogged you could be and follow up on these things. Well, I really wasn't very interested, and I knew nothing about it. But once I asked, started asking questions, I was accused by your Republican senator friends of engaging in a political witch hunt and also engaging in muckraking to destroy the reputations of some honest public servants. Oh, Tom, that was a knee-jerk reaction. You know, sometimes we can't help ourselves. Hey, you guys would have done the same thing. I know, I know. But what really frustrated me, Frank, was that my own Democratic colleagues who got me into this thing in the first place, then they abandoned me. Now that surprised me. I thought you Democrats would have jumped on this scandal and seen that as your way to get back into the White House. Well, you got to understand, Frank, at this time, it truly was a fishing expedition. You know, for all we knew, it could have been just bureaucratic bungling or perhaps just in inconsequential administrative overreach which caused them to uh, give away those leases. Well, I'll admit, the more it dragged on, the more suspect you looked. Yeah, and Secretary Fall understood that. So he dragged things out for as long as he possibly could. Oh, he refused subpoenas time after time, claiming sickness or claiming pressing work matters or claiming other problems that he had. And then President Harding died while he was still in office. So at that time, it looked as though it might be more risk than benefit in continuing to investigate his administration. So why did you stick to it, Tom? Well, I kept fishing because I knew something was fishy. The more that fall obfuscated, the more I began to believe that there was something sinister behind it all. Well, it was Fall's tactics which drove me on. Well, he sure underestimated how tenacious you can be. Well, he did underestimate me, that's true. I finally was able to get Fall before my Senate committee. And when I had him there, I probed into the President's authority to issue that executive order by which the oil reserves were transferred from the Naval Department to his Interior Department. And I also asked him a whole series of questions about the procedures that he followed in soliciting bids for the leases. Looking back on it, Secretary Fall did a wonderful job of always directing the conversation away from anything that could be dangerous to him. And he discredited me and many times made me look like a fool. I guess I, I underestimated Fall also. The committee will come to order. 
Senator Walsh, you may proceed. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Fall, whose decision was it to lease the Teapot Dome Oil Reserve exclusively to Harry Sinclair's Mammoth Oil Company? Mine, in my former capacity as Secretary of the Interior. And why, sir, did you believe that you had jurisdiction over the lands which belonged to the Department of the Navy? Executive Order 3474. Sir, did you ever inquire into the President's authority to transfer those powers which had expressly been granted by Congress to the Secretary of the Navy? The President can regulate his own cabinet. Well, Mr. Fall, by that logic, the President could equally well have transferred that power to, uh, oh, the Secretary of Agriculture, for example. <laughs> These weren't corn oil reserves, Senator Walsh. <laughs> the, the expertise in crude oil extraction resides in the Bureau of Geological Survey and the Bureau of Mines, both under the Secretary of the Interior. Well, presumably Congress knew that when they granted those powers to the Secretary of the Navy. I don't know whether they knew it or not, sir. Well, are there no geologists in the Department of the Navy? Their geologists are not experts in drainage. There are geologists and there are geologists. The expert geologists at the Bureau of Mines understand underground oil geology. Their work begins where the rock geologist's work ends. If such a radical change in policy was warranted, why not bring this before Congress for its consideration? Apparently, the President of the United States had no doubt about his authority to handle this just the way he did. Well, did you ever seek advice of counsel on what the President's authority really was? Well, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, what evidence do you have and did you have at the time that in fact drainage had taken place from that oil field. <laughs> I cannot say that there was actual drainage. It is impossible for any man in the world, I don't care who he is, to look under the ground, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Fall, did you call for competitive bids when you sought to lease the Teapot Dome oil? No, sir. Didn't you feel that the law required you to do so, sir? Mr. Fall, are you aware of the general policy pervasive throughout all of the federal statutes which require bids for government and municipal contracts? I am, although I suspect I will soon find out I am not as familiar as you are, Senator. <laughs> I call your attention to Section 3709 of the revised statute, sir, which reads as follows. All purchases and contracts for supplies and services in any department of the government, except for personal services, shall be made by advertisement a sufficient time previously for proposals respecting the same. Surely you don't believe that that statute would require bids for the leasing of naval oil reserves. Well, why would you not think so? Because I don't. I don't think that statute is applicable at all. Well, sir, the Naval Oil Reserves do fall within a Department of Government, do they not? Well, certainly, but that statute is not applicable to a case of this kind at all. Why is it not applicable? Why is it applicable? Well, it is a contract for services, is it not? Personal services. Personal services? Personal services? Oh, yes. It is personal service, if it's a service at all. Is it not personal service if persons are drilling wells and producing oil? Oh, <laughs> that, sir, is not personal service. You certainly could not seriously contend that. I do not agree that the statute is applicable here at all. Well, Mr. Fall, we certainly have a different opinion upon that question of law. <laughs> well, Senator Walsh, if lawyers did not differ, 
there would be no lawyers. <laughs> Which might be for the best. <laughs> Mr. Fall, were you or are you now employed by Mr. Sinclair or are you in any way at all receiving compensation from Mr. Harry Sinclair or any of his interests? No, sir. Well, didn't you just return from a trip to Russia with Mr. Sinclair? Russia? I must say, this is beginning to feel like a witch hunt. Yes, I did return from a trip from Russia with Mr. Sinclair, but I was paid nothing more than expenses. And what then was the purpose of that trip, sir? I have been advising Mr. Sinclair on important matters of U.S.-Russia relations as he explores drilling opportunities there, but without any compensation whatsoever. For the record, Mr. Fall, you have not received one thin dime other than travel expenses from Mr. Sinclair or his interests? That is correct, sir. That will be all. I would like to add an additional statement at this time. Oh, proceed. My actions have doubled the strength of our Pacific fleet. My only regret is that because of my actions, President Harding has been unfairly criticized. He is dead now and cannot speak for himself. I may choose to recall you for further questioning. I loathe this city. It was hard enough coping with war and sudden death, but these shameful, politically motivated, fake stories about scandals are, are just draining me. His body wasn't even cold before these vicious rumors started. I am so sorry you weren't given the opportunity to grieve in peace. I haven't had the opportunity to grieve at all. You were the beacon of strength and professionalism while he was laying out his state. The nation needed the opportunity to lavish its respects. I know his preference would have been a simple service, but he died a president. He was magnificent in life, but he was even more wonderful in death. <laughs> Till these damned vultures swooped in to try to pick his bones and discredit his administration, especially that Senator Walsh. Have you been following his one-man quest to destroy Albert Fall, a true patriot? Yes, Ned keeps me informed. I think the world of Albert. I encouraged Warren to put him in that position, you know. I didn't. Albert made the right decision selling those drilling rights instead of letting all that oil get drained away and lost, but... Walsh has tainted everything. His committee hasn't found that Albert Fall did a single thing wrong, but now there will always be a cloud of suspicion. Well, Ned insisted that the Washington Post be very fair in their reporting about Albert. I warned Albert that if he went to Russia with Sinclair, he would just cause more suspicion. They very much had the wrong tie for him. What? The morticians. I always picked out Warren's ties. Did they think I wasn't going to pick out his last one? Oh, should have been prepared. Madame Marcia foresaw this. You told me. Why wasn't I prepared? I had only one black dress to my name. I had to send out two of my gowns to be colored black. No one is ever prepared. Now it has come true, the fulfillment of fate. Oh. And now they're coming after me. Uh, who? The muckrakers, suggesting that the reason I refused an autopsy was because I had poisoned my husband. There was. There was such an agonized look of pain on his face when he died. He tried to speak, but 
No words came. I screamed for help, and he was... He was gone before anyone could reach him. That must have been terrible. The Reverend told me that men want to die suddenly. Not me, I told him. Don't let me go if there is a single spark of life in me. In his last hours, Warren said kind things about the newspaper correspondents. We in the business are all a family. Madame Marcia saw something else in the stars I never shared with you. Oh? She said, death will also come to me suddenly. It will follow my widowhood. Frank, at that Senate hearing, there were two independent geologists who supported Secretary Spall's theory that there had been drainage from those oil fields. At that time, the bottom dropped right out from under the scandal, and nobody was interested in Teapot Dome anymore. Well, not nobody. Well, what did you call me before? Dogged? <laughs> I didn't doubt that there was some drainage that took place, but was it as much as Albert Ball claimed? I really didn't buy his argument there that there was that much urgency to the entry of those leases and that the oil couldn't just be stored right there in the ground. So, you didn't believe those expert geologists? Well, as I said, there was something fishy. If there was such urgency to the entry into those leases, why was it done in such a bizarre manner? And then also, it was just about that time that rumors started circulating about the improved financial circumstances of, of Secretary Fall. Huh. And at that time, I started thinking we should be looking more into bribery and the possibility of conspiracy. But Tom, it still appeared that you were the only one that really cared. Well, I thought that might be the case. But then one day, an investigative reporter came into my office, and he shared with me a treasure trove of information mm. about the financial affairs of Secretary Fall. You know, Tom, that's strange. Normally with reporters, the information flows the other way. You're right. Well, this reporter, a guy by the name of D.H. Stackelback, was with the Denver Post. He had written a story for them, and his editor had stepped on it, quashed the story. So Stackelback brought the information to me. Now, according to Stackelback, during that period of time in 1922, all of the ranches in New Mexico were having a terrible financial times. So, oh, there was drought and there were low cattle prices and other things. All of the ranches, that is, except for the Three Rivers Ranch owned by Secretary Albert Fall. That ranch, unlike all the others, was being completely redeveloped. It was a decrepit condition, being completely redeveloped and electrified and uh, Fall was even buying more cattle and more land. He didn't do that on a cabinet secretary's salary. I can attest to that for sure. No, sir. What's even more suspicious, he was making all of his transactions in cash. About the same time, we learned that Fall had been visited at his uh, Three Rivers Ranch, that were rather than by Harry Sinclair, the oil executive. Well, once we started thinking about that connection between Fall suddenly getting rich and Sinclair suddenly getting the Teapot Dome oil lease, we decided we had to try to find financial connections for that. Tom, how'd you do that? Cash is really hard to trace. Well, you're right. That's where Harry Sinclair made his fatal error. Harry Sinclair paid off Albert Fall in the form of government liberty bonds. That caused the scandal to come completely unraveled. Aha, uh -huh. now I get it. Liberty bonds have serial numbers. Exactly. And the uh -huh. first national bank of Pueblo, California, had written down those serial numbers on every single uh, deposit made by Albert Fall. <laughs> that enabled us to trace those liberty bonds from Fall to Sinclair, who gave them to him, and then to that continental trading company that you asked about before, that one that's engages in the bribes. 
Well, when we found that out, and when the public learned about it, and the reporters learned about it, they became interested in the Teapot Dome again. But uh, Attorney General Doherty refused to investigate. So that's why Coolidge appointed Special Prosecutor Roberts to investigate further, and if he found any wrongdoing, to prosecute it. Exactly, uh -huh. exactly. And the first thing the Special Prosecutor figured out, he simply confirmed that this Continental Trading Company was, in fact, a sham corporation created by the oil executives for purposes of taking money out of their companies and passing it on as bribes on behalf of the oil industry. The successful prosecutor then tried to figure out where else those bonds were going, and he found a large block of them being delivered to the Republican National Committee. Through Will Hayes, I bet. Now, don't remind me of that sleazy fellow. Exactly right. Well, once we had all this information in hand, we decided that it was time to put a subpoena both on Mr. Harry Sinclair, the oil executive, and upon Mr. Hayes, the party executive. We put subpoenas on both of them and brought them in for hearings before the Senate. I bet it was an entirely different Senate committee this time around. Indeed it was. I could hardly get a word in edgewise. Every senator on the committee wanted to get in on the questioning to be in the limelight, each one more indignant than the one before. Even your Republican senators. Well, Tom, we had to be indignant. You know, we Republicans, we normally are called the grand old party. Well, the public that started to call us the Grand Oil Party. <laughs> Mr. Hayes, I understand you wish to make an opening statement? Yes, with your permission and, and, that, and that of the committee, yes. You may proceed. <clears throat> It is my understanding that this committee is investigating transactions of the Continental Trading Company to determine the beneficiaries of government liberty bonds connected with the leasing of naval oil reserves. It is now a matter of common report that the Republican National Committee was the recipient of some of these government bonds. I wish to say at the outset that I have only recently learned of this. I did not know of the existence of the Continental Trading Company at the time I was assisting in raising funds to clear the uh, deficit of the Republican National Committee. <clears throat> Mr. Harry F. Sinclair did turn over to me a certain amount of government bonds, and I have come to learn that these bonds may or, or may not have been originally in the possession of the Continental Trading Company. <clears throat> the Republican National Committee needed to clear a substantial debt <laughs> from the campaign of 1920. So in 1923, uh, among those to whom I appealed was Mr. Harry F. Sinclair. He contributed $160,000 in the form of Liberty Bonds. I delivered $60,000 of these bonds to Mr. Fred Upham, $50,000 to Mr. John Pratt, and $50,000 to Secretary John Weeks to aid their fundraising efforts. <clears throat> Gentlemen, I must ask you to consider that nearly eight years have elapsed since the campaign of 1920 and that I had nothing to do with the keeping of the books. You will readily understand that I knew nothing that would have enabled me to identify the bonds, and I did not know that there even was a Continental Trading Company, and all of the information I have now is what has reached me through the newspapers. There was no connection between Mr. Sinclair's gift and any of the dealings with respect to oil leases. Now, Mr. Hayes. Yes. You said that Mr. Sinclair provided bonds valued at... One hundred sixty thousand dollars. Yes, yes, yes. Was there any other contributor as generous? <coughs> to my personal knowledge, I, I cannot tell you. No. Uh, you know, gave sixty thousand dollars in bonds to uh, Mr. Upham. Yes. And what did Mr. Upham do with those bonds? Well, they were used to help with the uh, deficit. <laughs> How? Well, I don't know. Uh, the, well, I wouldn't. I, mean, I, I didn't know the details. So what did you expect Mr. Upham would do with $60,000 in bonds? I expected that he would use them. And use them how? Use them. For fundraising efforts to uh, 
to resolve that debt. So yes. How would he use them to resolve the debt? Just as other securities are used. And how are other securities used? For raising funds to resolve the debt. Circles and circles and circles. Mr. Hayes, why don't you just sell the bonds and use the proceeds to pay off the debt? Well, they were not given for that purpose. Then what purpose were they used for? For raising money. I want to have an answer to my original question. You must have some idea about how Mr. Upham was going to use the money. Not specifically. As a matter of fact, didn't Mr. Upham take those bonds and distribute them to various people in the city of Chicago in the amounts of 1000 to 25000 And didn't those people sell and pretend to make contributions in equal amounts to the Republican campaign fund? Well, certainly not to my knowledge. Oh, <laughs> you would be surprised if such a thing happened. Oh, yes. Well, let me surprise you. Within weeks of getting bonds from you, Mr. Upham, deposited in the National Bank of Chicago on November 3rd, 1923, $10,000. On November 9th, 2000 Two deposits of 5,000 on November 17th, oh, two deposits of 5,000 and one of 1,000 on November 30th, $25,000 deposit on December 5th, four deposits of 1,000 each. Do you think these deposits totaling 60,000 have any relation to the fact that shortly before you had given him $60,000 in bonds? No, not to my knowledge, no. <laughs> Oh, it looks a little suspicious, doesn't it, sir? Oh, I would not lie. I, I wouldn't say that. No, no. Suspicious? Oh, no. Uh, then Mr. Upper, Mr. Pratt, and Mr. Weeks, did you give Mr. Sinclair Liberty Bonds to anybody else? No. Nobody else? <laughs> no. Would it surprise you to learn that Secretary Andrew Mellon testified before this committee that you sent him $50,000 in Liberty Bonds yes. and requested a $50,000 donation. I, 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 no. No, it didn't happen? Yes, I, I mean, no, I mean, I mean, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me, no. So, you did send him $50,000 in Liberty Bonds. I did. Why? Yeah. Oh, Why yeah. didn't you disclose this when I first put the question to you? Well, because they, because Mr. Mellon returned to them. Yeah, you see, he said he preferred what really he wanted to to make a contribution directly. You know, a donation without any strings attached. So I, I understood that this committee here, well, that you wanted to understand the disposition of the Liberty Bonds, but these these were not used. So so I didn't think you were asking about these. If Mr. Mellon had accepted the bonds, you would have told us about it, no doubt. Oh, certainly. Yes. Oh, I would have, yes. You didn't think the efforts to use the bonds were relevant to the question? I did not think so. No, I didn't. No. If you had attempted to bribe a public official with bonds, oh, and he had rejected yes, your yes. offer, yes. you would not have considered that relevant either, would you? That is not, that's not fair. That, no, really, not, no, that's not a fair question, Senator. No. Uh, Mr. Hayes, this committee believes that an effort to use the bonds for any purposes is just as relevant as a successful effort to use the bonds. Well, I really, I mean, Secretary Mellon didn't, did not, he didn't, he didn't use the bonds as security. Would it make a bit of difference in your opinion of the moral and ethical aspect of it, whether Secretary accepted the bonds or did not accept the bonds? It depends. Uh, oh, the way that they were given to him. Yeah, but they were given to him under a plan, which I had in mind, with an obligation to pay it back. Pay it back. A loan? Yeah. <laughs> you were asking for a loan from Mr. Mellon when you gave him $50,000 in bonds? No, no, no. I, I was going to negotiate that. I was going to negotiate it with him as, as security, you see, for the contribution. But of course, it was not necessary with him, obviously. Uh -huh. Would you please explain this so that we can understand this with an ordinary mind? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Yes. If I sent Mr. Mellon $50,000, mm -hmm. and Mr. Mellon sent the committee $50,000, 
that secured that $50,000, which he sent to the committee, until we could repay it to him and get the bonds back. I don't understand. I suppose I do not have an ordinary <laughs> mind. Uh, so you believe that Mr. Mellon, the third richest man in America, I am told, was in desperate financial circumstances and unable to make a contribution. Oh, certainly not. No, 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 no. I, 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 I think you know that I did not think that when, when, when you asked the question. No. Now, um, if, if he had kept the bonds as security for a loan, how then would the Republican National Committee be any better off than it was before. Yes. Well, now I, well, I, I can say that, that, that if he had accepted those securities and sent money and held the securities until we raised the money, that would have been used for just the purpose they were, they were intended. <laughs> and you would still owe Mr. Mellon $50,000, would you not? Exactly, <laughs> yeah, but the committee's deficit during that period would have been taken care of. Why would you prefer to owe Mr. Mellon rather than the bank? The debt during that period would have been paid. We would then raise the money to take care of it again. Yeah. Sir, so, yeah. so you believe yeah. that if you pay one note with another note, the note is paid? Well, we didn't have to owe Mr. Mellon because Mr. Mellon then made the contribution. <laughs> Mr. Hayes, did you associate these bonds, this oil money, from Sinclair with the Teapot Dome investigation? No, sir, no. Don't you recall, sir, that the Teapot Dome investigation, including Mr. Sinclair's involvement in it, was receiving great publicity at that moment that he gave you these bonds? No. No, no. See, this transaction was as far divorced from the dealings that they could handle it. No, no, they're far divorced. Pa you can't possibly imagine a connection. I, I had no thought, no thought of it at all when I solicited him or, or, or when the bonds were used. Right. Now that you have a full understanding of the intent of our inquiry, did you handle any of these Sinclair bonds with anybody else whether or not you return them, whether or not you just offered them, or in any other manner to anybody at any time that you have not yet told the committee. No. I can remember nothing. I remember nothing. No, no. So this committee has all the information about your transactions with the bonds and your efforts to use them. Yes, yes, yes. All, all that I can recall. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. This witness is dismissed. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. That's a trail of money. Wow, this is really something. The committee calls Mr. Harry F. Sinclair. He has either of those talking about it. Yes, you got to do this. If you have these, you got the things that you have to do. Mr. Sinclair, this committee is charged by order of the Senate to inquire in the, into the disposition of Liberty Bonds acquired by the Continental Trading Company. Mr. Sinclair, when was your first interaction with that Continental Trading Company? The first I heard of it was in November 1921 at a meeting with Mr. Blackmer of Standard Oil, myself representing the Sinclair Company and Colonel Humphrey, representing the Mexico oil field, whose oil I sought to acquire. And what was the outcome of that meeting, sir? An agreement to purchase 33 million barrels of oil. And how did the uh, Continental Trading Company figure into that transaction? Mr. Blackbird brought it in. He wanted the agreement with Humphrey to be made with the Continental Trading Company. What did you know of the Continental Trading Company at that time, sir? 
It was unknown to me at that time. I mean, in way. fact, it was been formed only a day or two before, uh -huh. so it could hardly have been known to anyone. Oh. Oh. It was unknown to me at that time. Oh. And Mr. Sinclair, what was the Continental Trading Company's negotiated purchase price for the Humphrey oil? $1.50 per barrel. How was your company involved? Sinclair Oil would purchase that oil from the Continental Trading Company. For how much? $1.75 per barrel. So the Continental Trading Company was making 25 cents per barrel on the entire transaction. Is that correct, sir? I could not say that for sure. You knew they were buying well, it at $1.50. Yes. And you knew they were selling it at $1.75. Yes. So they were getting 25 cents a barrel. Yeah. I could not say that for sure. Oh. How oh. could you fail to know it? Some of that money might have been given to somebody else. So whether or well, not they were giving it to one person or another, 25 cents a barrel came of it. There was a difference of 25 cents. It certainly took a long time to get to that, Mr. That Sinclair. Why should anybody be making a profit at all? I don't understand your question. Okay, look. One man is willing to pay a dollar fifty. You are willing to pay one dollar seventy-five cents. You're in the same room together. Why is a third man making any profit? Doesn't every businessman Try to make oh, a profit. Yeah. Uh, if Mr. Humphrey knows that you're willing to pay a dollar seventy-five, then why doesn't he deal directly with you and take the extra twenty-five cents? I cannot answer for Mr. Humphrey's. Uh, uh, won't answer. Did you yes. ever tell Mr. Humphrey that you were willing to pay a dollar seventy-five? I did not. I was working with Mr. Blackmer. But you were all still in the same room. Is that a question, Senator? My question is, why were you dealing with Mr. Blackmer? I considered Mr. Blackmer to be the broker of the transaction. And why should there be a broker? That's we yes. work with brokers in our business each and every day. I do not ask why or how. There, 25 cents commission. I just figured. On 33 million barrels is north of eight million dollars. Did, did that seem a reasonable to you for doing for doing nothing more than sitting in a room? No. I thought it was exorbitant. Well, uh, why whoa, did you enter why? into a contract which gave him an exorbitant commission? Right. Because Mr. Blackmer agreed to pay my company a fair amount of that commission. What oh, fair amount did you yeah, agree yeah, yeah. upon? We never discussed it. Never discussed it. Do we, do we, you left it to him to determine what would be a fair amount? I did. When did you discover just what share you would be getting? I never got any share. Did you not just testify that Mr. Blackburn agreed to pay you a fair amount of his right. commission? I testified that Mr. Blackburn agreed to pay my company okay, a okay, fair okay, amount okay, of the right, commissions. Okay. When did you discover just what share your company was going to get? When I received the last payment. And uh, that would make it on the 17th of November? Yes. No. In 1923, sometime. 1923? What, 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 that's two years. So over the course of two years, you just left it to Mr. Blackmere to deliver to you whatever he thought was felt was a fair share of the profits? Yes. How much Whoa. did that amount to? Seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. How and when did you get your share of the commission? I didn't get any share of that commission. How and when did you get your company's share? I got it in the form of Liberty Bonds over a two-year period delivered to me by Mr. Blackmer or a messenger. Well, wasn't that payment via Liberty Bonds a rather unusual way in which to reimburse your company? 
I wouldn't say so. <sighs> well, uh, have you done it before or since? It would be unusual to do it day after day. Do you have a record of the bonds that were delivered to you? No. You kept no record? I kept a personal memorandum of the bonds as they came in. Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. Now, is that memorandum available to us? No. Why not? I destroyed it. When? <laughs> Recently. How? Recently. In the past 10 days, I think. Oh, oh, 10 days. Do tell, what was your purpose in destroying it, sir? The transaction was completed. The transaction was completed five years ago. No, I only recently turned over the bonds to my company with an interest of 3.5% of okay. the time they were received. And why, why then, didn't you turn those bonds over to your company I saw at the time they were delivered to I you? I saw no particular urgency to it. Oh, uh, where were the bonds kept? In my private vault. Why in his there? Vault. I felt the vault in my home would be just as safe oh, as any dear. other vault. And a large amount of Liberty Bonds, Senator, takes up a great deal of space. Regrettably, some of the continental payments were hopelessly mixed in with my private assets in the vault. <laughs> well, Thankfully, I, I knew exactly how much I received and passed on that information to my company. Did you ever advise anybody at your company of this trust agreement? I did not testify that I had a trust agreement. Did you understand that you were receiving those bonds in trust for your company? I understood that I was receiving those bonds for the benefit of my company. Let me put it in your language then, sir. If that is preferable to you, did you advise anybody at your company that you had received those bonds for the benefit of your company? I don't remember. He doesn't remember. Oh, <laughs> you have this committee understand, Mr. Sinclair, that a transaction of that size and that character, you do not remember whether you disclosed it to anybody representing your company. That is correct. Mr. Sinclair, how could you not advise your company that you would receive $757,000 of property for its benefit? I felt the directors of my company had entire confidence in me, and they would be advised of this sooner or later. And suppose something had happened to you. Here, here. How would your have company learn about that transaction? As I testified, I made a pencil memorandum. Oh. I think that would be sufficient. And you destroyed it. So what was on that memorandum? If I remember correctly, it stated I received bonds of such and such amount such on such, such and such, such a date such 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 delivered such to me such for the benefit of my company from Mr. Blackburn. And that's the memorandum you destroyed? Yes. Didn't you anticipate that the committee might want to hear from you on this matter? I did not anticipate that the committee would want to see a memorandum. Of course not. Mr. Sinclair, a subpoena was leveled on you on... Uh, here, here. April 24th, can you tell us whether the memorandum was destroyed before or after that date? Hmm. I think it was after. Of course after. it was. After 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 the after the How much did you turn over to your company as interest on those bonds? Uh, I think it was 142000 and some odd dollars. And how was that amount arrived at? It was computed by somebody in my office. So, did you give that memorandum to the subordinate who then made the computation? I did not. I gave him dates and amounts. Did you have the memorandum in your hand at that time? I did. Ah, oh, and you read that to him from that memorandum. I did not. What? What? Well, well, what? Did you do? I wrote the information on a piece of paper and told him to compute the interest. So that is to say, you had the information on one memorandum, 
and you transfer that information to another memorandum, and then you handed that memorandum to him. Yes. So your board of directors has only your own word for the amount of bonds you got and the dates you got them. Yes, I would say so. Well, what sort of receipt did you give as the bonds were delivered to you? I did not give a receipt. As, uh, aren't we to understand that Mr. Blackmare or somebody representing him turned over to you from time to time bonds to the amount of $750,000 without ever taking a scrap of paper from you to indicate that they had? I did not give anybody any receipt. Yes. Oh, well, did you, while these bonds were in your possession, make an income tax return oh, on the profits? Yes. I did not make any profit. What, you do not consider these bonds to be a profit? Not for myself, no sir. Oh, did the I mean, Sinclair Oil Company make a return showing these profits? I do not think so. I imagine they will. <sighs> so no one has ever made any income tax return on these bonds you recently delivered to your company. When you say no one, do you mean for me to answer for all 120 million people in the Where United the States? Did they know about the bonds? Who? The 120 million people that you are speaking about. I would imagine they do, based on the publicity that has come out of this committee. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. Don't, don't try. Mr. Sinclair, will you please tell this committee what was the occasion for your visit to Mr. Albert Fall at his Three Rivers Ranch just prior to the execution of the Teapot Dome lease on November 15, 1922. It was in reference to the leasing of the Teapot Dome Petroleum Oil Reserves. Sir, there is testimony before this committee that $233,000 passed to you, from you to Mr. Fall through a Mr. Everhart in the form of Continental Trading Company bonds. What, sir, was the reason for that transfer to Mr. Fall? I was purchasing a one-third interest in Mr. Fall's Three Rivers Land and Cattle Company. Well, surely then, sir, you have received dividends from that investment in the ranch. I have not. And, but you must be aware of the condition of that ranch. Not to any extent. Well, how many livestock are there? I could not tell you. How much land is under cultivation? I would not attempt to give you that information. And how much is under irrigation? I could not say so definitively. Sir, have you paid any attention whatsoever to the investment you made by giving $233,000 to Mr. Fall the day before you signed that lease? Very little. And why not? I have had other things to do. Oh, I am oh, a very yeah. busy man, busy, and busy. I have complete confidence in the people who are operating that property. Well, sir, surely, sir, you have a certificate of stock or other writing which you received in exchange for your $233,000 investment. It was issued to Mr. Everhart as a trustee and has remained in his name. The stock in Mr. Fall's ranch has never been issued in your name, sir? It has not. Did you ever have any prior business relations with this Mr. Everhart that you used prior to the time that this certificate was issued in his name? I did not. Mr. Sinclair, do you have any writing whatsoever to show your interest in the Three Rivers Land and Cattle Company for which you supposedly paid $233,000? I don't think so. And how was it that you happened to let this Mr. Everhart, with whom you had no business relationship, take the stock in his name and you had nothing to show for your $233,000 which you had given to Mr. Fall. 
I had complete confidence uh -huh. in Mr. Mm -hmm. Everhart and implicit confidence in Secretary Fall. I felt no anxiety about it whatsoever. <laughs> With these uh, Continental Trading Company bonds, you also made a $160,000 contribution through Mr. Hayes to the Republican National Committee. I believe that is correct. <sighs> For once. <laughs> <laughs> what was the inducement to contribute $160,000 at that time? There was no inducement to make a donation of any money to any party. Mr. Sinclair, when Mr. Hayes was on the stand, he was unable to recall anybody else who had made a contribution of that magnitude. We were told by Mr. Andrew Mellon, who is reputed to be the third richest man in America, that he gave only $50,000. How came it that you gave more than three times as much as Mr. Andrew Mellon? I can only answer that by saying that Mr. Mellon was far more sensible than I was. Yes, it would appear. <laughs> Mr. Sinclair, let me summarize your testimony. Out of the Continental Trading Company bonds, that oil money, which were delivered to you by Mr. Blackburn, you made your contributions to the Republican Party. You also allege that you bought a share in Mr. Fall's New Mexico ranch, wherein you mistakenly used those continental bonds because they had been mixed in mixed with your other in. assets. Yeah, right. Now, no record of your deal with Mr. Blackburn has been made known to any officer of your company or even your personal secretary, and you delayed the delivery of your share of this kickback, these profits to your company <laughs> for a matter of five or six years Yet you contend that you always felt that it was the property of your company. <laughs> Mr. Sinclair, do you really expect the, the public to consider that these were legitimate transactions, sir? I cannot be responsible for the public's opinion. No, I don't think you can. But can you shed some additional light which might make the public believe that these were legitimate transactions? I do not know how the public feels about it, and I am rather inclined to leave that matter to the public. Without any assistance from you. Without any assistance from me. That will be all, Mr. Sinclair. The nation owes you one big debt of gratitude. You know that, don't you? I must say, Frank, that I don't feel much gratitude very often. There are a number of people that continue to accuse me of being a political hack and having engaged in that investigation simply for political purposes. Not, but not anybody who matters, Tom, and certainly not people like me. Well, thanks, Frank. I appreciate that. It's, you know, now that the U.S. Supreme Court has upheld those lower court opinions in the Mammoth Oil cases that held that Sinclair and Fall were engaged in a conspiracy, those leases have been voided. The public now has them again. What a nice little bow you have put on that whole thing. Well, Frank, that was only the civil case. Now all we can do is hope that the criminal cases continue to be pursued by the special prosecutor with equal enthusiasm and effort and that they come to the same successful conclusion. But again, that's the business of the special prosecutor, not me. This matter is not over, but my job is done. Well, Tom, I can't tell whether you're relieved or disappointed just tired. Well, well, Tom, here. I hope that you are proud of what you've done. Because of what you have done, we now have campaign finance disclosure, complete disclosure, under the Federal Corrupt Practices Act. And under the Revenue Act, Congress 
can get the tax returns of any of any public citizen, and whether they are elected or appointed. And more than that, the Supreme Court has ruled that the Congress has the power to subpoena any witness, and if they refuse to appear, they can be arrested. Now, what, what a legacy you have left for our country. You know, Tom, I can't ever foresee that anything like this can happen again in these United States. <laughs> We can only hope. <laughs> My name is Albert Fall. I was the Secretary of the Interior under Warren Harding. The Navy had begun leasing some of its petroleum reserves under Woodrow Wilson, but the millions of dollars in royalties were going directly into the Treasury rather than helping the Navy. I believe that the petroleum reserves should be used to strengthen our Pacific fleet against the growing threat from Japan. I leveraged my relationship with Harry Sinclair to structure a lease with his mammoth oil company to extract oil from Navy lands. But instead of paying royalties into the Treasury where they'd be lost forever, I had him build pipelines and storage tanks for the Navy and fill those tanks with converted fuel oil because Crude oil under the ground in its native form is useless and cannot power ships. My name is Harry Sinclair. I founded Sinclair Oil. After the Senate hearings, I was tried for conspiracy for my role in the Teapot Dome leases. Leaving nothing to chance, I enlisted the help of William Burns, who had been Harding's chief of the Bureau of Investigation, the predecessor of the FBI who now ran the Burns International Detective Agency. He assigned a dozen of his men to shadow and influence the jurors on my trial. <laughs> when the prosecution caught wind of what I was up to, the judge declared a mistrial, cited me in contempt for jury tampering, and I spent six months in prison. On my retrial, I was found not guilty of conspiracy. The jury believed that I had indeed purchased one-third stake in Falls Ranch and had not been attempting to buy his favor. Paradoxically, I, on the other hand, was found guilty of accepting a bribe. I was fined $100,000 and sentenced to one year in prison. <clears throat> My name is Will Hayes. I was also a member of the Ohio Gang. Yeah. I was chairman of the Republican National Committee and appointed Postmaster General by Harding. To pay down the excessive debt from the 1920 campaign, I laundered Harry Sinclair's Liberty Bonds by asking wealthy individuals to make contributions to the Republican Party, and then, inter and then I repaid them uh, for their contributions with Sinclair's Liberty Bonds. I went on to be the supervisor of morals for the motion picture industry. <laughs> My name is Carrie Phillips. I was Florence Harding's closest friend until she learned of my 15-year adulterous affair with her husband. During the Great War, my pro-German statements led me to be investigated by the US military intelligence. I am the only known mistress in U.S. history to have successfully blackmailed a, a presidential candidate. That is, until I got screwed out of my money when he died two years in. My name is Warren G. Harding, 29th President of the United States. I never really had any problems with my enemies. It was my friends that caused all the trouble. You know, I believe the little extra money on the side for those who commit themselves to public service is perfectly understandable. But I may have been a, a little too trusting and a little bit over, uh, lax in my oversight of the selection of my cabinet. Because it appears that there were a number of things that went horribly wrong that 
I had no idea it took place. You knew that I was selling hospital supplies meant for veterans' hospitals. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. In fact, you instructed me to stop doing it. And did you? No. Well, there you go. <laughs> Once I told you to stop doing it, I didn't know you were selling hospital supplies. Yes, you <laughs> did. You got so angry when you found out that I didn't stop that you grabbed me by the neck and called me a double-crossing crossing bastard and ordered me to resign. And to my credit, I made you resign. Yes, and allowed me to flee to Europe before the scandal broke. Thank you for that. Well, what are friends for? <laughs> but eventually, I returned to the United States and was convicted of conspiracy to defraud the U.S. government fined $10,000 and jailed for two years. Well, by that point, I had already died in office. <laughs> My name is Frank Kellogg. I served one term as U.S. Senator for the great state of Minnesota. I was defeated again in 1922. At a rally at the, Saint, or at the state fair that year, the crowd booed Vice President Coolidge and me. Now, because of President Harding's death, the Republican Party was able to weather the Harding scandals. Coolidge was elected president. He appointed me Secretary of State. I negotiated the Kellogg-Brion Pact. I got the Nobel Peace Prize. St. Paul even named a street after me. <laughs> now, as to Special Counsel Owens, he did get appointed to the Supreme Court. But his investigation took six years, and he was only able to get the conviction of one person, Albert Ball. I got a bum rap. <laughs> <laughs> I petitioned President Hoover for a pardon based on my, my ailing health. But since I was the only defendant convicted because of the Teapot Dome scandal, he wasn't so inclined. The U.S. Marshals took me into custody and drove me to the state penitentiary in an ambulance. I served my entire sentence in the prison hospital. After my release, I spent my few remaining days in a VA hospital. I died destitute and never paid that fine. My name is Madame Marcia Chantenay. I began as a fortune teller on Coney Island, but worked my way up to be astrologer to the White House, Congress, and the Supreme Court. Florence Harding consulted me frequently. I had predicted her husband's election and untimely death. My foreknowledge greatly influenced the Harding administration. Harry Houdini became alarmed at the public servants who began to be influenced by uh, spiritualism. He argued if they were vulnerable to such delusions that this would be a threat to democracy. <laughs> Well, in 1926, Mr. Houdini gave four days congressional testimony uh, trying to gain support for a bill that would levy fines against fraudulent fortune tellers. I testified against the bill, and Congress sided with me. But through his testimony, Houdini managed to out and shame enough politicians that he turned the public sentiment against spiritualism and astrology. As a parting shot, I told Mr. Houdini that I knew something he did not, that he would not live to see another November. And he died. October 31st. <laughs> My name is Evelyn Walsh McLean. I was a close friend of Florence Harding and introduced her to Madame Marcia. I am best known as the last private owner of the 45 carat Hope Diamond, which is rumored to be cursed. My first son was killed in a car accident. My daughter died of a drug overdose. My husband ran off with another woman and died in a mental institution. And my family newspaper, the Washington Post, went bankrupt. I was the victim of a fraud by a grifter named Gaston Means, who claimed he had a deal to 
free the Lindbergh baby for a $100,000 ransom. He took off with my money. My name is Florence Kling Harding. I heavily influenced my husband's career from his newspaper business up through his presidency. I put him in the White House and was his presidential advisor. I encouraged women to be politically active, and I was the first First Lady to vote. I was a member of the League of Women Voters and the National Women's Party and promoted the Campfire Girls and the Girl Scouts. I cannot believe that 100 years have now passed and there still hasn't been a woman president. <laughs> betrayed by several members of my husband's cabinet, whom I had considered friends and for whom I had lobbied for their appointments. Sensitive to my husband's legacy in the face of emerging scandals, I burned hundreds of his documents, which I felt might be uh, misconstrued. I was a strong believer in the occult, and neither I nor my husband was ashamed when I introduced astrology into the White House. The stars were the only things I felt I could rely upon as true. I died 15 months after my husband. <coughs> Called it, just saying. <coughs> <laughs> the ladies of the Senate passed a resolution honoring Florence Harding for her conscientious performance as First Lady. I penned an anonymous remembrance published in my husband's paper, The Washington Post. It read, Florence Harding was a good woman, as good as gold, as true as steel, as brave as a lion, as gentle as a dove, as sweet as flowers. Florence. You were a good scout. You stuck with me after knowing all of my faults. And you stood by my side through thick and thin. <laughs> my name is Tom Walsh. For 20 years, I was a United States Senator for the great state of Montana. Half of those years involved with the Teapot Dome investigation. Were it not for my resourcefulness and my persistence, the truth may never have been known. In 1933, I was appointed to the office of Attorney General of the United States of America by the incoming President, Franklin D. Roosevelt, but I never took the office. I died of a heart attack on my way to his inauguration. I continued on as president of Sinclair Oil and died a very wealthy man. Oh, and if you need to fill up on your way home, there is a Sinclair gas station not far from here on Grand Avenue. <laughs> Good night.